be joining in the due time, I guess. It has been a bit hectic days these days, and I think it will be more hectic days ahead. Uh, very sad situation because of the Corona pandemic. I know all people, all of you, along with your preparation, are doing your best to contain and help the people, uh, uh, all the patients around. So it is really a tough job handling studies along with the work. I appreciate uh, the work you are doing. But uh, whenever you get your time, you can uh, just go through your portions. Uh, I think the exams will also be a bit delayed because of the recent pandemic. I think the same situation like the last year is going to happen. Uh, I'm not sure, but I guess. So don't stress out. Give your best. And stay safe and stay stay healthy. So do all uh, even during these gloomy times, uh, we have some uh, something to rejoice because uh, all the followers, all those who are following the fine neurophilia series, have got a happy news. And uh, the happy news is that, uh, like last year, uh, last year who have been following the neurophilia series and uh, that is the time when we had just started the neurophilia series uh, we had a huge success because uh, about the or out of the total hundred i'm not exaggerating this is the actual uh, results we had uh, those were in my group uh, this is actually a non-profit group i just started because of my passion for teaching uh, so uh, we had success last time and uh, so after that Last year's success, the first exam which was conducted this year was the AIMS mid exam. And this AIMS mid exam, uh, we have about 13 of the students from the group being selected uh, for the exam. And the theory which had about 80 questions, if you see through, I got the question from the recall. Most of the questions uh, from the AIMS, about 40 of them were from the what we had discussed in the fine neurophilia series. We had uh, completed about 12 modules and we, uh, if you divide neurology into 20 modules, uh, if you divide the whole of the neurology into 20 modules, we had nearly completed about eight, eight portions of it in about 12, uh, 12, sec 12, uh, 12 sections. So about half of halfway through we are gone. And uh, so in that itself, we had about uh, nearly 30 to 40 questions directly being discussed in the fine neurophilia series and which helped the neurophilia, uh, the AIMS aspirants. They had uh, messaged me and they th thanked the neurophilia series uh, for that. So I, those who are really, uh, following the series, uh, which is freely available in YouTube. So make best use of this free content and uh, the, you can check this. Uh, I had uh, in my YouTube uh, site, I had just uh, taken expert clips from the fine neurophilia series and uh, discuss uh, the discussion part of the questions which were, uh, which had come in the AIMS series. So you, you can just check. One. So for how far we have come in the neurophilia series since it was started in December 2020. So it's nearly five months since we started. We had completed about 12 modules. This is the 13th module. You can ac as, uh, get access to it free just type fine neurophilia in youtube and you can watch and revise again whenever you get time because uh, it's very difficult i know in this time of uh, covid times because you will be working uh, with covid duty along with uh, your studies so i hope you must have revised the last session our previous session was the peripheral nerve disorders basics so about peripheral nerve disorders, uh, uh, you may you know that it is a vast topic. It is a large topic. Uh, main emphasis is basically on the Guillain-Barré syndrome, CADP, and the hereditary motor sensory disorders. We neglect the rest of the other part because it is uh, actually not much discussed in the case of uh, our uh, entrance exams. But a few questions which usually are important in the clinical scenario are all, all usually discussed because that is. Uh, usually come uh, usually uh, come usually are repeatedly asked in the entrance exams so let's start from where we had uh, stopped or discussed in the last class 
so let's try answering the questions one by one so last time we had started with how the chancel had helped the nerves get the covering that is the chancel forming myelin around both the myelinated and the non myelinated unmyelinated nerve cells so just emphasizing the fact schwann cells are derived from which of the following uh, structures so is it the ectoderm endoderm notochord or the endoderm so some are confused whether it's ectoderm endoderm notochord you know the most of the nervous system is derived from the notochord so uh, neural crest actually is derived from uh, so schwann cells is actually derived from the uh, uh, neural crest and you can see that melanocytes are also derived from the neural crest so the importance of this factor so neural crest uh, development we, you have to study the embryology of neurology uh, that is neural development uh, we had discussed in the stroke part of the neurophilia series that questions could come as mcqs when uh, the anterior neuropore gets closed when the posterior neuropore gets closed etc etc very important uh, so revise that portion the importance uh, in clinical scenario is that in case some patients with malignant melanoma or we treat some patients with melanoma lysates develop cadp and that is the importance because the, this uh, cadp you know it is due to demyelination and the association with mel between melanoma and cadp might be explained by the molecular mimicry because both melanoma and schwann cells are derived from the common neural crest tissue and share the common glycogen antigens so you know this demyelination is due to the uh, removal of the uh, covering myelin sheath and this occurs due to uh, destruction by antibodies the antibodies uh, act like in a mimic molecular molecular mimicry fashion and this could be uh, explained by a common origin as in case of melanoma and the transfer having a common origin pattern so that is the importance of uh, knowing the embryology part so that was regarding schwanzel let's try to answer this question which is the most common subtype of gillen barry syndrome uh, now uh, we find in asia so we can try to answer so i have taken this question directly from the bradley latest edition okay uh, so you can see that uh, we may think actually most common type of gillen barry syndrome is no doubt the demyelinating variant aidp but uh, in asia actually aman that acute motor axonal variant is coming up and it is now considered to be the one of the common types so there is a demyelinating variant and axonal variant of uh, uh, gillen barry syndrome as opposed to our common notion that we think that gillen barre syndrome is always a demyelinating type it is not so we have an axonal variant it affects the axon most and it is coming up in a high uh, it is incidence is coming up more in case especially in the asia asian population and uh, this uh, is from uh, so we think that it's demyelinating but as we had discussed last time this axonal variant is coming up high in incidence in recent times so this is from bradley 8th edition a man is now considered to be the most common gbs type in asia and it is otherwise called as a chinese paralytic syndrome and in which uh, you know that demyelination we had discussed extensively last time demyelination there will be a prolonged distal latency with decrease in conduction velocity but in axonal type there will be no changes in latency and velocity but there will be decrease in amplitudes and the difference from uh, adp and uh, this thing is that aman improves as rapidly as patients with adp and it will be having a campylobacter jejuni in, uh, infection if you test for them especially in uh, that was rep reports from china and it is also suggestive of a molecular mimicry adp you know you, you won't get the specific uh, ganglioside antibody 
but Aman will get the specific ganglioside antibody. So that is one more thing. Specific ganglioside antibody is present in Aman, but not in AADP. AADP will have a wide variety of antibodies, not specific, but no specific one. But the most common antibody found in AADP among all would be GM1. Most common antibody would be GM1, but it is not specific for anything. But Aman will have specific uh, antibody. So uh, let's see this question. A 45-year-old male presented with a rapidly progressive pro quadriparesis. And uh, it was ascending a type of quadriparesis. He didn't have any cranial nerve symptoms or ophthalmoplegia. And uh, on ex doctors, when examined, found that he had muscle wasting and had areflexia. Bystanders were informed regarding a very bad prognosis. What is the likely diagnosis from among these uh, four uh, syndromes? That is uh, Glenn Barry syndromes, which is the most likely diagnosis. So the patient uh, has got ascending uh, reflexic quadriparesis. There is wasting is there and has a very poor prognosis. So we know that there are two types, demyelinating and axonal. Axonal has Aman and Amsan. Aman is actually motor axonal and Amsan is motor sensory axonal. And there are other variants like M Miller, MFS is actually Miller-Fisher syndrome, which has got ophthalmoparesis, ataxia, and reflexia as the classical triad. So yes, most of them are answering correctly. It's actually Amsan, which is acute motor sensory axonal neuropathy, which is, has got a very bad prognosis. And uh, the problem with this is actually is that uh, the patient uh, will have poor prognosis and uh, it is a fast progressing disease. So these are the common subtypes uh, of which ADP is the demyelinating one. And the other rare variants, Miller-Fisher syndrome, ataxic variant is there. And the pharyngeo cervical brachial variant, which is the localized variety, and facial diplegic variant, and paraparetic variant, and acute pan dystrophonomia. There will be more of autonomic symptoms in this kind of variant. So if you divide it, uh, axonal forms are basically Aman and Amsan. And pure, pure auto, atypical forms will be having asymmetry, pure motor, sensory, and sometimes Aman will have preserved reflexes. Some variants will have uh, of, uh, sometimes preserved reflexes. So as we have discussed last time, ADP will have uh, demyelination and the weakness is due to, not due to the axonal block, but due to a conduction block. And there will be rapid remyelination and rapid recovery. Aman also there is uh, degeneration, rapid regeneration and rapid recovery. But other forms as in case of Amsan will have a bad prognosis and has got a delayed uh, recovery. So a 58 year old woman presents with swaying while walking and diplopia. She came to OPD with history of swaying while walking and diplopia. On examination, uh, she had at ataxia and uh, areflexia. Antibodies of which of the following ganglioides uh, are likely to be present in this patient? Yes. So there is no doubt uh, you will be uh, going wrong in this antibody. So antibodies in guillain barre syndrome, uh, you, shouldn't, uh, you should be thorough with. Uh, don't get confused because multiple antibodies would be positive. I told you, AADP, there is no specific antibody. Uh, it will have multiple antibodies, the most common of which would be a, a GM1 and others I'll just discuss in the next slide. So this, the answer is GM, uh, GQ1B antibody. And you know, actually Miller-Fisher syndrome is actually a, a spectrum where Miller-Fisher syndrome is on one end and the bigger stuff encephalitis, which is a brainstem encephalitis is on the other end. So these two will have the bigger stuff encephalitis and the Miller-Fisher syndrome will have the GQ1B antibody positive. So you can see this is the table from Harrison, because stuff encephalitis and Miller's special syndrome will have GQ1B. And the second most common antibody in this would be the uh, GT1A antibody. So uh, the others you can uh, you can note down. Uh, GM1, uh, Guillain-Barre, actually there is none is 
specific, but GM1 is more common. Uh, specific for motor sensory and uh, motor axonal would be GM1. So, a patient, uh, see this question, a patient with arthroplexic quadruparesis was treated with IVIG. You know the treatment for Guillain-Barre syndrome is IVIG or plasma paresis. His weakness improved completely. He was sent home. But on the fifth month, he developed worsening of, of his symptoms. And uh, he again became paraparetic and was again given a uh, dose of IVIG. So what do you think the patient is having? So you can give the answer. What is this known as or what is the diagnosis? So the patient after treatment completely improved. He present, uh, presented again with recurrence of the paraparetic arthroplexic quadruparesis and then again had to be treated with IVIG. And what is this known as? So read the question carefully before answering. So all the structures in the questions need to be analyzed again. You know, now got to, to know that the patient was having GBS and in the question it is, giving, it is being given that the patient completely improved and the patient presented only after fifth month. So there is no confusion that usually the cutoff for uh, uh, treating or uh, giving the diagnosis, whether getting confused, whether it is a treatment related fluctuation or an acute onset of CADP or a subacute onset of CADP, subacute CADP is actually two months. So that confusion is not at all there in this question. So this is actually a case of recurrent GBS. So I put this question so that you carefully analyze the question before answering and don't jump into conclusions. So recurrent GBS actually is a two or more episodes of GBS with either a minimum interval of more than four months between the episodes. And if the patient did not recover completely, if, if the patient did not recover completely and more than two months when, it, the, when there was a complete or a near complete recovery, we have a GABS disability scare, uh, score, scoring system. So if the patient had a complete recovery, uh, then we take the cutoff as two months. If incomplete recovery, the cutoff is actually four months. So treatment related fluctuation is actually, there is a fall, fall in, so I'll uh, explain with this chart. So you can see that uh, this is uh, actually in the top of the chart, you can see there is actually no weakness. And the paralysis is in the, in the, in the y-axis, it actually worsened. So if you see a normal GBS, what happens is that patient was normal. Patient, uh, when we give IVAG, patient improves. That is the normal cause of the disease. And improvement actually, our patient stabilizes by about four to eight weeks, patient stabilizes. That is the normal cause of a GBS. In case of treatment related fluctuation, what happens is that by four weeks, uh, four to eight weeks, there is fluctuation or worsening occurring uh, within the two month uh, period. So, um, and acute onset of CADP actually uh, worsens beyond eight weeks. So treatment related fluctuation is improvement of in the GBS disability scale of at least one grade. So we, when we treat the patient, patient improves that is after immunotherapy. And that is, this is followed by worsening in the scale. And uh, that is also one grade within the first two months after the disease onset. So the cutoff is actually two months. And acute of onset of CADP should be considered when a patient thought to have a GBS deteriorates again beyond eight weeks from the onset or when this occurs three times or more. So the, that is what, has been shown. So normal course is actually four to eight uh, weeks stabilization. And uh, within two weeks, if there is uh, one uh, score decrease and then uh, worsening, then we call it as a treatment related fluctuation. And if it is uh, beyond uh, two weeks, then we call it as acute onset of CADP. And wh what is uh, subacute onset of CADP? Actually subacute onset is actually worsening from four to eight weeks. So that is a subacute onset. That is actually a controversial progressive motor or sensory dysfunction consistent with neuropathy. And it uh, reaches a peak within four to eight weeks. So usually, you know, GBS peaks by within four weeks and stabilizes by four to eight weeks. When it peaks at four to eight weeks, it is considered as a subacute onset of 
uh, CADP. It's the controversial enzyme. So uh, you should know about this treatment related fluctuations, uh, acute onset of CADP. And uh, so this will come in the question. Uh, so that is, uh, which of the following is not an option for treatment in case of uh, Gillen Barry syndrome? Can try to answer this. Uh, do you get the answer? Uh, I actually opened the chat. Mansiji, can you close the chat for me? Okay. Okay, steroids. So this question could be reframed, uh, reframed in multiple ways. So you know the multiple studies are going for uh, GB has been done for GBS. So the combination in this question could come as IVIG. You know definitely is used. Flex is definitely being used for uh, GBS therapy. So options could come as steroids with plasma paresis. And you know based on the severity score and the time when the temporal uh, association, the time when the patient presents, we modify the treatment. If the patient has got only a minimal score in the uh, GBS uh, disability scale, uh, we definitely uh, we won't go for a uh, plasma process or IV. And uh, if the patient comes uh, with high uh, high dis disability, then only we go for IVIG and plasma process. And the uh, IVIG is most effective uh, basically within two weeks uh, of uh, therapy, two to four weeks of therapy, uh, and uh, that is the reason. So do, have you heard of something called 20, 30, 40 rule of identifying uh, the risk patients in GBS? So what is this rule? So, and uh, what is the wrong, what is the incorrect statement regarding this rule given in this MCQ? So any patient coming with uh, GBS, we have to be really careful. We cannot uh, say that if the patient comes in the, on the second day of illness, we may find that the nerve conduction study is normal. There won't be any albuminocytologic dissociation. We have to carefully admit, admit the patient and see and check for the progression of the disease. So well, there will be only a few things which will give clue. In electrophysiology, there are a few clues. Like early things would be an absent H reflex uh, or an impersistent F wave. That will be the only finding. And uh, the finding which uh, there are many uh, many findings which we should be careful of. So respiratory things we should be careful of. Uh, single breath count we have to see in the bedside. And uh, one more thing which is uh, very important is actually the 20, 30, 40 rule, which tells us whether we should go for an intubation or uh, whether we should go for an ICU care for a patient coming with a paresthesia which uh, occurred before followed by mild buckling of both knees and weakness and a reflexion on our examination. So which is the incorrect statement in 20, 30, 40 role? So we know in 20, 30, 40 role, we are dealing with what actually respiratory uh, capacities. So the answer here is, uh, uh, the wrong statement here is maximal inspiratory pressure should be less than 30. So this is uh, this is directly taken from Bradley. So this I think would be asked for you because uh, for a clinical practice, for a clinical uh, for a physician or a neurologist, this should be uh, uh, always in your fingertips. You have to see for this these values. So either it should be less than twenty or a decline from thirty percentage. If a patient is a non-case of COPD, then uh, you cannot expect vital capacity to be as normal as this. So 30% from the baseline and maximal inspiratory pressure to be 30 and expiratory respiratory pressure of less than 40. So that is that how that's how we get the 20, 30, 40 rule. So learn this by now itself 20, 30 vital capacity decline by 30, inspiratory pressure 
first inspiration 30 then expiration 40 and uh, for intubation so we admitted the patient so in whether we are the patient needs intubation we cannot just uh, check the single breath count every time and uh, assess the intubation uh, whether the patient needs intubation uh, because there is a high chance that the patient will go for a respiratory failure so we have to anticipate that so for that uh, force vital capacity fall below 20 to 15 or if the patient is already having a severe oropharyngeal weakness if it goes below 18 and when arterial uh, oxygen pressures fall below 70 with inspired uh, room air, then we have to go for a ventilatory uh, ass assistant with elective intubation so that the patient doesn't deteriorate. So that is the importance of uh, treatment. So which of the following electrophysiological parameter is specific for a diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome, especially in elderly? So especially in elderly, uh, you have to see this. So all these are clinical aspects uh, which I have emphasized in this advanced module. Uh, so a patient with Guillain-Barre, all the theory part you must have read in the last time discussion. You know that the GBS is the most commonly dealt with and also the most commonly asked question in, your, in case of peripheral neuropathy. So this question, always in the question read uh, all the uh, important uh, structures in the question. So. Here you can see that the most important thing is specific. Then the uh, one more important thing is, which is given is actually elderly. So I haven't complicated the question for you, but you know all these things come handy for you in diagnosing a case of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So you know there is a prolongation of F wave. Why the F wave gets prolonged? Because there is demyelination. Most likely in case of GBS, we are dealing with AADP, demyelinating type. So there is a prolongation of F wave. Absent H wave, H reflex. H reflex is usually uh, absent. It, it is one of the earliest uh, findings. You know, abnormal axon wave. We discussed the uh, various late reflexes in case of uh, uh, in case of a nerve conduction study. So one of that is axon reflex. And uh, we know that sensory ratio. We this, uh, this something which is more specific in case of a uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome is the sural sparing. So Last time, one of the uh, uh, attendees had asked me regarding why the several sparing occurred. We'll discuss uh, about that in the later slides. So actually, more specific for a Guillain-Barre syndrome is several sparing. And uh, of this, most sensitive would be an absent H reflex. So uh, in, a, in case of an early Guillain-Barre, all the electrophysiological findings to appear, it takes about four to seven days. Even the albuminocytological dissociation, which we expect in a Guillain-Barre syndrome. Albuminocytological dissociation means there is, when we do a CSF, there is no cells, but the protein is elevated. That also, it takes time. So for an early detection, we may get an absent H reflex and also something called a impersistent F wave could be found. Uh, so H wave, this is the most sensitive one. So this actually rules out uh, the, this is a sensitive thing, but it can be found in other neuropathies. So this is not specific, specific for Guillain-Barre syndrome. And these all are findings in Guillain-Barre syndrome and they could be found early in the disease. And what I, if the option was sural sparing, that is also an answer, sural sparing. But what happens is that in case of an elderly, if I had an option given here as sural sparing, what would you go for the answer? if the third option here was sural sparing. So if sural sparing is given in the option, in the same question, then also you should go for a sensory ratio. Because here, in case of an elderly, what happens is that all the uh, elderly, usually when the patient ages, sural now naturally has a decreased sensory amplitude loss. So what we are expecting, actually, sural to be spared in a GBS. In elderly, already the sural is spared. So that is the importance of this sensory ratio to detect a sural. Um, that is sensory ratio will help you in more carefully, specifically detecting a GBS in case of a elderly patient presenting with suspected GBS syndrome. In young patient, a sural sparing will be more than enough to differentiate it from any other neuropathy from a GBS. 
and all others would uh, these findings are more uh, useful in case of an early gbs but the, these are sensitive but not specific for gbs so that is the importance difference between specificity and sensitivity of these values so these are the other things which we discussed last class about h wave f wave m wave axon reflex and all i won't go back because of lack of time so earliest and most sensitive is x reflex abnormalities f wave abnormalities which we could find is f wave impersistence so f wave should come in a regular um, fashion there is impersistence it is not coming regularly and uh, there will be multiple or complex axon waves these are all uh, given in bradley so you could be asked the same things and uh, i told you that uh, snaps sural sparing is actually a pattern in gbs in elderly a um, very specific one would be the sensory uh, ratio that is lower limb nerves uh, that is the ratio of upper uh, lower ratio we uh, we had uh, discussed that is sural plus radial by a median plus ulnar nerves so why this is very important is i'll tell you and much more one more point which was given in the bradley was 90 Six percent specificity was found when there was sural sparing com combined with abnormal F waves. So that also you have to keep in mind. So why this is important? Because elderly patient, uh, there is one thing, one more thing, they already will be having an absent sural snaps, or they will be having a existing CTS, that is carpal tunnel syndrome. So uh, these are the factors, uh, uh, additional factors which may uh, have. Uh, thing make us think that the patient is not having gbs we, uh, we may think that the patient is not having sural sparing uh, then uh, we may think that uh, we may have a false feeling that the patient is having some other neuropathy other than gbs so the ratio more than one distinguish it from gbs so now to the question so at that time i didn't also didn't have a correct answer to it now also i am a bit confused uh, but Uh, explanations very many hypotheses from many, multiple texts i could find out why sural sparing in gbs you know it's actually a demyelinating type of illness even in case of axonal variant of gbs that is both amanda and amsan along with aadp sural sparing has been found to be uh, uh, present so what happens is that in uh, there is actually it is due to you know that during gbs there is increased uh, chance that the patient will be having a demyelination or the pathology affecting the nerves so this common entrapment sites that is the median and ulnar are thought to be a more compressive compressive site or a entrapment site that is uh, ulnar nerve and uh, median nerve so that is one of the hypothesis that these sites are more early affected than the sural site sural is actually not an entrapment site so hand hence pair that is one thought process then are the another thought process is that actually you know it's actually a myelination process getting disrupted and you uh, need the more myelinated nerves the more highly myelinated nerves will be affected first than the less myelinated ones and median is uh, upper limb nerves are more myelinated than the uh, lower limb that especially the sural nerve and that is one of the thought process hypothesis that that is why median and ulnar are more affected in a case of sensory median and sensory ulnar are more affected than sural nerve in case of gbs these are the uh, two hypotheses uh, not a uh, correct explanation as far as i am concerned but uh, these well, these are the two things which i could come up with uh, if anyone has better answers you can send it to me so which one of the following inherited neuropathy so we have discussed in detail regarding inherited neuropathies especially same like scar spinal cerebellar ataxia you know the last times very many questions were asked from scar like that similarly this is a high yield topic from uh, hs hmsn which would which could be asked in your questions uh, in the future exams so study from that portion the charts from the uh, harrison and bradley and repeating it to you uh, study from that portion uh, so just to recap that you must have gone through it but uh, again i'll put you one question so the inheritance pattern of this are repeatedly asked in uh, in exams especially in the institute exams so you have to be thorough so every chapter you study regarding these hereditary patterns and all just 
keep in mind make a note uh, which is actually not autosomal recessive which is a x linked type and keep a note of it for revision during just before your exam so which of the following inherited neuropathies are not autosomal dominant yes so i think most of them have revised their last uh, class very well uh, <laughs> Okay, so some of them have answered it as uh, HSA. So I'll tell you that HSA, hereditary sensory uh, and autonomic neuropathy type uh, one. Actually, HSA and most of the types are actually autosomal recessive, except for HSA and type one. HSA and type one is actually autosomal dominant. Hereditary sensory autonomic. We have a predominant sensory, you know, HMSN, hereditary motor sensory neuropathy or Charcot Marie Tooth disease. is even though the name has got motor sensory uh, the predominant finding or clinical feature would be a motor the patient won't complain much of a sensory finding only in electrophysiology we get the sensory finding you know the champagne bottle appearance of the leg you get the pest cavus and all the findings you know and you know the four types main four types which we discussed the last class and of which the autosomal recessive one is typically said to be cmt4 all has got exception but typically what we say is actually cmt4 has got autosomal recessive inheritance and similarly hsan will have autosomal uh, one type 1 will have autosomal dominant inheritance and less fap familial amyloid polyneuropathy will have autosomal dominant and you know hnpp that is hereditary liability to pressure palsy which we discussed in the last class is actually autosomal dominant so recessive forms are classified as cmt4 and uh, they have young age of onset and uh, they have additional findings which you can read through so these are the findings uh, and uh, you know that these are actually small fibers so the problem is that in case of when we test for the electro uh, diagnostic testing this is our nerve conduction study they are basically uh, for detecting large fiber problems so nerve conduction study will fail to uh, detect problems and will detect problems only in the later stages so uh, out of which hsa and type 3 you should know it is uh, called a relay day syndrome relay day syndrome it is a predominant dysautonomia which will be primary dysautonomia familial dysautonomia which will be the presentation so that was regarding so try to answer this question a 22 year old woman uh, female with history of transient right foot drop two years back she came right now uh, with some other problem but had a history of right foot drop when she had uh, sat down with uh, her legs crossed and she had an ncs with her, with her which showed a conduction block of her fibular head but with uh, her usual physiotherapy and splint uh, put uh, over her leg she improved but now she presents with weakness of her intrinsic hand muscles that is the difficulty in gripping and moving her hand and when repeated uh, nerve conduction uh, was uh, done she had ulnar neuropathy at the elbow when uh, history retrospectively when she was asked a uh, history like was some was she injured or anything she recalls that she had uh, hit her el elbow multiple times just before this symptoms started and further probing her family history reveals that her father and brother also had similar episodes of weakness in foots arms etc when they were young adults so with this history in mind what do you think is the diagnosis of this patient so this is question number 10 i guess yes question number 10 so what is your diagnosis is it a hereditary motor sensory neuropathy any type uh, type 1 type 2 type 3 or type 4 you know type 3 is actually degrain sorta disease so it can't be vasculitic neuropathy patient is having a uh, 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 one time uh, at a specific time patient was having foot drop another two years later presented with ulnar neuropathy so it is is it a mononeuritis multiplex kind of pattern is it multifocal motor neuropathy with conduction block 
the patient is a young uh, uh, patient with uh, multiple nerve involvement or is it hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure pulse what do you think the answer is yes most of them have got it right the answer is hnpp because the patient has got a significant family history and patient is actually having a uh, liability to pressure palsy whenever her uh, nerves are getting uh, liable to pressure pressure points uh, are getting uh, she is uh, liable to pressure she is getting uh, palsy that is previously when she had crept, kept her legs cross leg she got uh, foot drop now she has got ulnar neuropathy ulnar palsy so this is the chart where demyelinating neuropathies are divided into hereditary as well as acquired we can see that of this hnpp is coming as uh, hereditary autosomal dominant type of neuropathy it's otherwise caused called tomaculus neuropathy what is this tomaculus neuropathy we'll see and uh, don't forget this about this meta metabolic autosomal uh, neuropathy myelinating neuropathies these are actually fav favorite mcq questions you will cover this uh, mld crab is uh, adrenal leukodystrophy rasms faber tanger etc some of them we have covered in the last class but others especially the enzyme part of this the dominance the chromosomes the mri findings especially the brain and all and the other specific findings etc we have discussed this in some other portion or the other uh, you have to revise that part so what do you see here these are actually sausage shape this actually is sural biopsy specimen uh, and this actually you can see this are sausage shape sausage shape so tamacula means actually the word meaning is actually so, sausage shape so tamaculus neuropathy means sausage shape so nothing else so hnpp is otherwise called tamaculus neuropathy so nick the patient will present with recurrent mono neuropathies the patient ncs abnormalities uh, will be present even in the clinically unaffected nerves and there will be myelin multiple myelin thickening as we had seen earlier and it is got autosomal uh, dominant inheritance and it is actually a pmp22 deletion and if you get pmp22 duplication what is the condition called you can put it in the chat box what is the condition called pmp22 duplication i won't tell the answer but you can put in the chat box okay last class we had discussed all the H, uh, hmsns so go through that so a 52 year old male uh, presents with uh, sensory symptoms uh, with left wrist drop without any sensory symptoms one month back so it's kind of a pure motor syndrome wrist drop three weeks ago he started complaining of right hand weakness and last week he developed right foot so it's multiple uh, palsies now palsy is coming reflexes are absent in upper limb and right hand so it's kind of a patchy involvement his right patellar reflex is uh, diminished but left lower extremity reflexes are normal anti gm1 antibodies are present patient was worked up and anti gm1 antibodies are present csf is four cells proteins were 40 mg there is evidence of conduction block in nerve conduction study what is the most likely diagnosis i won't give any clue you can go with the answer so does the csf uh, give any clue uh, does the nerve conduction give any clue does the antibody give any clue okay okay uh, it's actually the question itself has got, got the answer you know that the patient has got conduction block so don't think twice and the csf is actually normal perfectly normal cells are within five protein is not elevated so it can't be anything else it could be it is the mmncb temporal focal motor neuropathy with conduction block it's rare it occurs in young purely motor neuropathy associated with asymmetric deficit and it closely mimics uh, motor neuron disease and the important thing is that we have to differentiate this disease from motor neuron disease because the treatment is ivig and we have to continue giving ivig because the patient needs multiple episode, uh, dosages of ivig and with time sometimes the ivig dose gets less responsive and higher dosing and higher frequency may be needed so this is one patient right now in my ward uh, i'll just 
show you the ivada ivada kutuna varum pole undo okay so this ivada korava ivada kutuna varum ivada kutuna this is a 65 year old female this is a 65 year old female uh, who presented with left sided weakness so 65 year old female who presented with uh, who is a non case of diabetes mellitus i think i'll uh, let you uh, read the history first then we'll go to the video so 65 year old female with type 2 diabetes detected 6 months back so when uh, when the time uh, the diabetes was detected it was actually 400 above first time it was detected itself hp and c was nearly 10 and she presented with lower extremity pain and weakness pain radiating to left hip and thigh four weeks ago she noticed that she was having difficulty lifting her he- hip up and also having difficulty in uh, she had buckling of her knees on examination she had significant thinning of her left thigh muscles and uh, she her ex- slrt was negative she had difficulty in uh, interpreting her sensory findings Uh, but on examination we could find out that her patellar reflex was absent on both sides but her angle reflex were present so patellar reflex was absent on both sides angle reflex was present plantar was uh, flexed she has been complaining of significant weight loss over past 6 months hb1c uh, has been con- uh, significantly normal and now it is actually perfectly normal this is uh, about 6 and her, her blood sugars are of the range of uh, today's fbs was i think about 100 which of the following is the most likely diagnosis so sensory you can see significant wasting here when compared to so proximal thigh muscles are wasted here and uh, sensory part and uh, if you see here she is unable to lift her left leg up uh, left leg up hip flexion weakness is there knee extension weakness about 2 by 5 about 3 by 5 is there and she also has difficulty in adduction she is unable to adduct her uh, leg and mild dorsiflexion weakness also is there in this uh, patient and uh, if you see uh, the jaw of this patient you can see the ankle jerk is absent bilaterally even after reinforcing with genra 69 but the uh, sorry patella jerk is absent in this patient but if you see if you clearly see you can see if the video is choppy you won't be uh, able to clear clearly uh, make out but uh, ankle jerk is preserved so with that history what do you think is the patient had patient had a uh, backache uh so this was question number 12 question number 12 so what is your diagnosis this is a multiple disc disease or mononeuritis multiplex diabetic amyotrophy or chronoscoliosis the patient uh, dab- uh, diabetic status is perfectly normal hb1c is fixed uh, his bl- her blood sugars has been constantly normal since past 3 months uh, plantar is flexor okay so how to approach this case so first of all whether the patient is having a problem yes the patient is having a problem for sure she is having it. whether it is lmn or umn you know it's a motor sensory syndrome and the patient is not having a plasticity or a spasticity plantar is flexor so and there is a shooting pain coming from that patient no bladder symptoms so it is kind of a lmn motor sensory syndrome so motor sensory could be only root flexus or multiple nerves so root flexus or multiple nerves so we are sure either of these so i have given that only in the option only conus coda conus is they are not there so we rule out that so out of which what do you think it is so now we have got multiple disc disease multiple disc disease is a possibility for this patient uh, mononeuritis multiplex 
also is a possibility. Diabetic amyotrophy is also a possibility. So this is actually a diabetic amyotrophy or otherwise called Brunt's Garland syndrome. It's a rare disorder uh, which comes in the uh, diabetic neuropathy spectrum. Monophasic illness, there will be asymmetric progression of pain, motor weakness. Patient will be coming up with uh, more of motor weakness and uh, patient will be having weight loss, reflexia, and patient will have initially in more involvement of one side and later there will be involvement of other side. That is why a patient was having bilateral and patellar jerk absent later and uh, the, that is why, uh, but the ankle reflexes were preserved. So you know that diabetes initially, if it was a long-standing diabetes, we know the ankle jerk will, would have been absent. So the risk factors for this disease is actually, it occurs in type 2 diabetes. This patient had rapid glycemic management and high glycemic management. Patient's HB1C was very high of 10. Now we had, con uh, uh, the, the diabetician had controlled it to uh, strict control of 6 and patient had weight loss. So that is one of the reasons. So you should or not always think that diabetic amyotrophy would occur only in case of a uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. It will be uh, occurring even in case of patients un undergoing rapid glycemic management or tight glycemic management. So otherwise called insulin treatment related neuropathy kind of uh, scenario. So that is one thing. So this was the patient's MRI. This is actually not a root problem. So Lots to discuss in this case. Um, I think we won't be able to finish if we go on discussing. So this patient was having ab adduction weakness. So we know that the obturator nerve is affected. Knee, hip flexion and knee flexion weakness. So that is femoral nerve is affected. And the patient had mild dorsiflexion weakness. And uh, that is one thing. So which of the following is correct regarding radial nerve? So in case of peripheral nerve, apart from reading about GPS, uh, CADP, HMSN, and other uh, diabetic neuropathy, you have to study the individual nerves also. Divide it as upper limb nerves, radial, medial, ulnar, and also the brachial plexus, individual nerves. Lower limb nerves, basically tibial, peroneal, sciatic, and femoral, and the uh, lumbosacral plexus. Make a ch chart of this uh, separately. Or every time you have a doubt, try to draw the brachial plexus again and again, like you studied in the first year MBBS. For the essay. So, which of the following is correct regarding radial nerve? So, these are the usual questions which will be asked. So, try to answer. Uh, you have to know this for sure. Can easily rule out if you know the brachial plexus correctly. Yes. Do you think it carries C8 T1 fibers? No. And uh, Okay, so answer is there in front of you. Uh, so it is actually a continuation of posterior cord. So just uh, every time you uh, get this, uh, always try uh, divide the, uh, always study the brachial plexus. I am not going into detail how to study, divide it as RTDC, root, trunk, division, cord, uh, every time and uh, then study the brachial plexus, plexus again. It will be a high yielding part because if you study that just revise your first year MBBS portion and I think you will get definitely two questions. One or two questions will be there in the NEAT exam this time for sure. Mark my words. And uh, this question, uh, 45 year old athlete who spent several hours a day weight lifting presents with aching shoulder pain. On examination, he had shoulder abduction weakness, external rotation of forearm weakness, while elbow is stabilized against patient's side. Sensory is normal, am adduction is normal. There is no winging of scapula. Is bicep tendon reflex is normal? What is your diagnosis? So if you know the brachial plexus, you will be able to uh, answer this question. So this was question number 14. Try to answer this question, question number 14. So that is the importance. So lot many questions you will be able to uh, answer with the uh, knowledge of simple brachial plexus and also the nerves and their muscle supply. So natural course, you will learn all this. Uh, so you, you have been definitely given that there is no winging of scapula. So that long thoracic nerve, those who have written the answer, you should know that it is not the answer. Thoracodosal nerve, long thoracic nerve. And C5 radiculopathy, you know that is, there is not that kind of a root pain. And you know, it, you know that it's beyond the root because of the multiple involvement. Adduction is involved as well as external rotation. So, 
suprus capillar nerve is involved because you know suprus capillar nerve supplies which two muscles supraspinatus and infraspinatus the supraspinatus muscle is involved in initial 15 degree abduction and infraspinatus muscle is involved in external rotation so that is the most likely answer but uh, if if i tell you that that option was not there and if it, the option was axillary nerve would you go for that think about it if the option was axillary nerve then would you go for it axillary has two muscles to supply which are the muscles deltoid and one more is the teres so what is the action of teres minor so if the same question i rephrase it with the axillary nerve injury at a proximal segment will you go for the answer just think about it so i just want you to uh, study the brachial plexus with these two questions so which one of the following is an incorrect statement so try to answer so always study the carpal tunnel syndrome and the meralgia paresthetica part also carpal tunnel syndrome and the meralgia paresthetica part last year questions were asked from meralgia paresthetica and both the carpal tunnel syndrome in the neat exam so these are the portions you have to keep in mind simple question i just wanted you to attempt so i think all, most of them have answered it uh you know surgical therapy is not indicated in all of the carpal tunnel syndromes you know that it becomes severe once the sensory part you know the median has got motor and sensory once the sensory gets severely affected then we uh, term it as severe and then only we think of that is sensory potentials are totally absent we think of uh, sense, uh, severe sensory uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and plan for surgery and all carpal tunnel syndrome patients we have to check for thyroid diabetes cell mellitus the pregnancy status etc etc so uh, drug induced neuropathy also you have to learn it is there in harrison uh, so this is some extra sorry i just stopped the poll it's not botasorbib it's actually oxaliplatin uh, actually this this platin group of drugs are notorious to cause sensory axonopathy you know it causes sensory uh, sensory ganglionopathy that is the patient will be presenting with severe severe uh, ataxia but of which oxaliplatin will cause cold induced if you go to a cold bath or a cold region there will be hyperalgesia severe pain a 30 year old obese man has numbness in the lateral aspect of thigh there are no motor deficit which of the following is the most likely structure involved so try to answer this question so if such a patient comes to you what do you think the answer would uh, what will you think of such a yes you know the answer it is actually meralgia paresthetica we are talking about but all don't always think don't always think that is actually meralgia paresthetica you should always think of a plexus injury lesion because we have to rule out other uh weakness or other nerve distribution uh, abnormality before concluding that the patient is just alone having a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve problem but the typical uh, in the uh, structure in the question if they want to the answer as lateral femoral cutaneous nerve would be an obese man the patient having a tight wearing belt uh, or the patient having that kind of job would be given in the question so uh, this actually this is the area uh, where the patient will be having that kind of a lateral lateral aspect uh, of uh, thigh this nerve originates from l2 l3 and uh, that is one of the reason so if the patient is coming uh, with the tight belts and all ask them to loosen it uh, avoid putting phones in the pocket etc etc you have to advise so meralgia paresthetica also study lumbosacral uh, plexus same like studying the uh, your brachial plexus you study the lumbosacral plexus this is also equally important especially in case of institute x so uh, read this question and try to answer a 40 year old man presents with pain in the right lower extremity radiating to the buttock down to the feet and there is sensory deficit in the posterior thigh not in the anterior and leg and the lateral aspect of foot there is weakness of plantar flexion also plantar flexion is weak and patellar reflex is normal but that is knee jerk is normal but ankle jerk is reflex so which of the following is the most likely diagnosis 
a similar question had uh, come in the recent aims that is which was conducted in uh, april 17 uh, i had put the same question in one of my mock exams so why did you think it is uh, peroneal neuropathy okay somebody some people thought it's l5 okay you know that is actually there is a radicular pain definitely coming from a specific root that the dermatome has been specifically written and also weakness is in plantar flexion and you know that is uh, it is not l2 l3 radiculopathy because weakness is not in the proximal thigh uh, region so that is ruled out l5 radiculopathy usually you know that the ankle jerk won't be affected the ankle jerk will be preserved in case of l5 radiculopathy and peroneal uh, neuropathy all the uh, movements uh, that uh, along with uh, it's actually dorsiflexion weakness it's not plantar flexion weakness so you should you should be thorough with your uh, muscle function so here clearly i think weakness of plantar flexion is certain right okay so s1 radiculopathy is the answer so s1 radical if affected then there is actually depression of ankle jerk but the ankle jerk is dep depressed so there is no doubt the answer is ankle jerk so that is the thing so uh, l5 radical uh, so study the dermatome and distribution so that from the question you will be able to just make out the answer even before the looking into the examination part examination it's actually you confirm the diagnosis because there is depression of ankle jerk which is less likely to uh, occur in case of a uh, l5 radical do you know any of the reflexes which uh, are specific to l5 radical you know s1 radical you when gets affected uh, you will uh, get uh, uh, absent ankle jerk that is why in electrophysiology the equivalent of h reflex is actually uh, ankle jerk h reflex equivalent is ankle jerk so similarly if l5 radical is affected how will you clinically assess that uh, the whether the patient has got uh, uh, that uh, l5 affection with a reflex do you know any reflex you can put in the chat box yes actually there is something called medial hamstring reflex which we all uh, actually ignore or fail to see there is medial hamstring reflex which uh, can specifically look into l5 radical involvement so how to uh, see uh, the medial hamstring uh, reflex is actually tap on the medial side and you can see the contraction over this this region so you can see there will be reflex action over here so that is the medial hamstring reflex you can note that point could be asked in institute exam medial hamstring reflex loss suggest an l5 radiculopathy as uh, ankle jerk uh, or achilles tendon reflex loss would suggest s1 radiculopathy so what is the most common cause of polyneuropathy in multiple uh, myeloma so more most common cause of polyneuropathy in multiple myeloma uh, actually i haven't i didn't get time to add on it's actually chemotherapy just keep in mind it's not due to infiltration uh, compression of nerves or diffuse ischemia and one more question i would like you to remember uh, in diabetes neuropathy actually in case of this brand scarlet syndrome and all the problem is actually microvasculitis which is causing this ischemia so you know the nerves has got vaso vasa nerve the sub nutrition is supplied through uh, vessels to the nerves so blood vessels that getting affected cause microvasculitis to that nerves causes uh, problems so this is one question anti sense oligonucleotide uh, is available for which of uh, the following conditions these are one of few advanced questions uh, which could be useful to you you know all these conditions causes neuropathy cerebral tendon stenosis giant axonal neuropathy where, where the patient will be having curly hair and other features tangential disease where the patient will be having orange tonsils transthyretin amyloidosis which is a type of familial amyloid polyneuropathy there are four multiple types which are autosomal dominant so which one of the following has a treatment that is anti sense oligonucleotide as a treatment for this one so the answer is transthyretin amyloidosis hereditary transthyretin uh, which is a fatal disease and for that i know tersen 
is actually a second generation uh, generation antisense oligonucleotide so it the, uh, it inhibits the production of transferrin by the liver and is uh, useful in case of uh, this thing uh, you know the drugs in fabrice disease it's fabricin that is uh, agalsidase alpha and agalsidase beta of which fabricin is the fda approved one and the latest one is galafold or migalsastat which is actually the uh, first oral medication for fabrice disease keep in mind these are advanced questions you could it could be tangier's disease like last class we had discussed tangier's disease orange tonsil more of upper limb involvement can have bifacial involvement not fda approved can uh, uh, keep it in mind this could be used so with that uh, we conclude this session of peripheral neuropathy it's actually a bit wide topic but uh, read that uh, portion of last class more emphasis should be given on basics of peripheral neuropathy as you had seen last times also questions from about h reflex it's not that these are advanced questions and all questions from these would come these are decider questions because these are not looked over that much you don't emphasize on these portions very much and we neglect these portion, portions as uh, md or uh, pediatrics or medicine students so you put time to see these videos uh, and then go back and revise or try to study so you know where to emphasize while reading harrison and bradley definitely you will have to read bradley that is the pattern i see in case of uh, exams which are coming so with that uh, we'll stop this session thank you